October 6th. We will start with the, a reminder of the code of conduct. I just want to remind committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair, council members, or staff. All members of the committee, staff, and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language, repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting, may result in removal from the meeting. This meeting of the Smart Cities and Services Improvements Committee will now come to order, and can we please call the roll? Foley? Jones? Present. Licardo? Cohen? Here. Mahan? Here. Got quorum, thank you. Great, we made quorum, excellent, okay. We uh, review the work plan, and I know, Rob, you were gonna give us an update on uh, requested change. Yes, Chair, um, please. So staff requested to move the October 6th, 2022 D2 item, City Initiatives Roadmap, Customer Service Vision and Standards Status Report to November 3rd uh, due to updated project timelines. And then also to balance the work plans, we wanted to shift the November 3rd, 2022 D1 item of Public Emergency Notification Status Report to this meeting um, and today. Uh, these were noticed on the agenda that was published. Great, and that makes sense to me. May I please have a motion to accept, accept staff's recommendation? So moved. Second. Great, let's vote. Jones? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Thank you. Great, uh, I do not have comments. I don't see anything under consent, so I believe we are ready to jump into our reports. And Rob, do you wanna give us an overview of what we're covering today? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Mahan, Mayor Licardo, committee members and members of the community. Rob Lloyd, Deputy City Manager for the City of San Jose. For our October committee meeting and with the updates to the work plan published and just approved, staff will present three items. The first, under agenda item D1, we have the bi-monthly status report on technology and innovation projects. This item provides the committee updates on initiatives, any major issues and mitigations to those issues. Second, under agenda item D2, we have the status report on public emergency notification, following up on questions from city council and covering use and improvements in recent emergency power and health events. The Office of Emergency Management will provide that update. And finally, under agenda item D3, we have an update to, uh, or on digital privacy specific to public outreach practices that support the city's digital privacy principles and policy and community-based technology use. The Information Technology Department will report on that item. Uh, Khaled Tofik, our Chief Information Officer, uh, is here to lead us off, Chair. Great, thanks. Welcome, Khaled and Shirley. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon, Chairperson Mehan, uh, Mayor Ricardo, members of the Council, and members of the public. My name is Khaled Tofik, Chief Information Officer, and with me is Shirley Young, IT Project products and project manager. We are here to report on the status of the innovation and technology project, showcase our new public dashboard and discuss options to measure, the, the, to measure and incorporate public values as we develop IT projects. We will also provide an update on the open audit recommendations and the independent verification and validation review process. Here's the latest approved city initiative roadmap for this year. IT staff will be supporting 13 city initiatives this year by providing innovating solutions, project management, new technologies, and critical data. Next, I will share how we're connecting the and aligning our IT project with the city roadmap across city priorities. And here's the map and uh, status of a major IT project and innovation across the city. We have updated this report since the last update to include completed projects and realigned projects with the best fitting enterprise priority. I will turn it over to Shirley to share changes since the last update. Thank you, Colin. Good afternoon, Ch Mayor, Chairperson, committee members, and members of the public. Shirley Young, PPM from ITV. 
Um, as Colin mentioned, our previous slide, we showed an overview of IT project status. For the next slides, I'll be digging deeper on project changes. Here we have two projects that have changed their status. Business process automation has changed to yellow due to capacity reasons. However, the C3PO team is currently hiring and interviewing for two more PPMs. Second, good news, development tra services transformation has changed to green with new timelines and they are on track. This slide shows our recently completed projects. We have a total of four, Urban Logic Pilot, SJ311 app, five new services were added, hotspot distribution, and rent registry 4.0. On this slide, we have our recently activated projects. The city building security cameras procurement is currently in the procurement process. The vehicle blight management system is currently in the human-centered design process by the vendor. This team will also, be, will also be reporting on this committee next month as well. And lastly, the Beautify SJ homeless encampment platform, which is currently in a planning and analysis phase. Here's the project summary showing how we're making progress. We have more projects on track, 15 projects, 42%, and fewer at risk, three projects at 8%. Next, I'd like to give an update on the remaining audit recommendations from the 2019 tech deployment audit by the city auditor's office. We are excited to announce that we have implemented number six. This is also reflected on the recent follow-up recommendation auditor report that was published last month. We are currently working on number seven and number nine to be implemented by the end of this month. On this slide, we're showing our new public dashboard for all key technology projects. This is an overview dashboard that shows total projects, estimated budget, estimated completed date, and budget against number of projects by enterprise priority. It's interactive. Users can drill down on the data points, and it is also accessible to the public. You can access this now on our city website in the IT department. In our next iteration, we will be incorporating project value within this dashboard. This is our second dashboard, not as pretty, but gets you all the information you need. Uh, it's more in depth. It has project details, includes description, and not just overall status, but also status drilled down by further different components. This, this is also interactive. Users can drill down by the filters on the left. And again, it's currently accessible and available on our city website. For future presentations, I'd like to note that a quick view of this will be shown, but we'll focus on primarily, one, the city roadmap, two, major status changes, three, what we're doing to mitigate, and four, activated and closed projects. For the independent verification and validation process, we have three projects scheduled to be re reviewed by October, and these projects were identified on a risk-based scaling system. I'll now hand it over to Khaled for a next step and close out. Thank you, Charlie. The sub subject of how we can capture the public impact and value has been discussed in previous meetings. We are currently exploring options to assess the public impact based on safety enhancements, time and cost reductions, and the number of impacted users. The goal is to incorporate the project impact and public value into our project management process, including the project charter, dashboard, and post-go-life -go evaluation. This is the, uh, the project management team, and as you can see, we have two vacancies that we are currently uh, uh, hiring for or evaluating, I mean, conducting interviews, and hopefully by the end of the month, we'll have two new members joining the team. We have great news to share. The city received the City Government Experience Award from the Center for Digital Government for the 311 Services for Equity and Accessibility. This award reflects the city's vision and appreciation for technology and innovation and the hard work of the city staff that serve our community. And with this good news, we conclude our presentation and staff is available for feedback and questions. Great, thanks Colin and Shirley, and congratulations. That's an exciting award, well-deserved. Thank you and the whole team for all the great work you've been doing. Um, great, why don't we go to the public, we have public comment. Blair Beekman. 
Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for the meeting today. I hope yourselves noticed that you didn't offer public comment for the work plan items that have been put off. I think that should be public comment was needed. I needed to speak and summarize what I felt was, uh, I think that item about, uh, you know, uh, customer service needs speaks to kind of the today's agenda and how I would like to frame and theme this meeting today is, is what is the future concepts of customer service and, and community? And we have to talk about, for all the good practice that you're doing here, we have to talk about the future of a better openness and accountability with our technology practices. Um, I think the ALPR meeting of the past month really proved we've got some things we really have got to work on. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you for the items listed here that uh, can do a little bit more work, Vision Zero Traffic Safety, uh, uh, Beautify uh, Services, and uh, Emergency uh, Recovery and Planning. With Vision Zero, uh, thank you that, um, well, just a reminder that you know, uh, for as, as much as we need the uh, community safety practices, neighborhood safety, we also need the open public policies. Those ideas working hand in hand is so key to our future. An important friendly reminder, beautify San Jose, good luck in how to bring in the human element of, of having to address our homeless concerns. And with uh, the emergency fiscal recovery and planning, that you started a concept uh, within city auditor's office of uh, uh, language interpretation issues. Uh, really good luck in that. I think that came from the voter eligibility things. I, I, good luck how you move forward with such an issue and to be considering you know, all the things around voter eligibility that can go into that and English only laws that we're trying hard to address. With my remaining uh, time, uh, I hope I will speak for the rest of this uh, agenda on the concepts of openness with community. That needs to be so clear and easy to work on for each other. Good luck to ourselves. Thank you. Back to the committee. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, let me see if my colleagues, I don't see any hands, I'll just start quickly. So congratulations again on the GovX award. Um, hope hiring goes quickly. I know that's been a challenge across the board, not just at the city. It seems like a challenge across the entire economy. Khaled, I was really interested in your mention of next steps around establishing, I think you said, stronger criteria for evaluating the value of a project. I think that's critical for the organization to make smart trade-offs about where we invest resources. I would also imagine for those implementing the work, it's pretty important to understand the why and, and the impact that the work is likely to have. Can you share a little more about how you're thinking about that and when that uh, next step, as you put it, would come back to the committee? Absolutely. Thank you for your question. The, the, the question of the impact and the values is really complicated. We looked at how we can implement something simple to, to uh, correlate this is important or not, but I think it's more complicated than what we initially thought it would be. Uh, the, the first phase that we took was really to implement the dashboard because that we felt that's really going to give the public a better view of what we're working on. And two, one of the things that we have implement, in, implemented for critical projects that we will have uh, a single page where they can get more details, a picture of the project or something related so the public can see and view what's, what's working on. So a few things that we're uh, contemplating to include in the assessment or the evaluation of the impact and value is one, how often do people click on the project and go to, to get more detail? So that's one aspect that we're gonna be considering and see how we can incorporate. Two, um, does the project have, how aligned is the project with the city roadmap and the direction from council and the city management? The third item, does the project have a safety element that makes it important uh, you know, more than other projects. And the, the last two is the cost and time safe uh, savings that we will have by implementing this project. And last but not least, the number of people that will benefit from that project. We're hoping by combining all these together, we'll come up with some formula that we can share with you by the next meeting, just to see how we can advance this conversation and take it to the next stage. Thanks, it does sound complicated. You have a, quite a diversity of projects there that you're working on. I would just reinforce that I think is um, 
important as it is to provide that transparency to the public, I, I would guess that maybe even the greater value will be to us internally in terms of prioritizing, making trade-offs, learning, if the expected value didn't actually end up being delivered, if it turns out that what we thought was going to be the impact of a project fell short or maybe exceeded our expectations on the positive side. I mean, I think there's a lot to say for kind of the internal learnings and the, and the cultural value of, of everybody being aligned around what matters and why, why we're doing the work and what the impact is. So I'm, I'm excited that you are thinking about that. I think it's really, it's really important because otherwise we can end up in checklist land where we're just plowing through you know, checking projects off the list because they were on a list somewhere rather than really being critical about what we're, what we're learning and what impact we're having. Um, unless you had anything else on that item, I am done with my comments. I think the mayor may have wanted to chime in on this item one. Yeah, that'd be great. great. Thank you. I was actually listening on the right end, so my apologies for not being here present, but I did uh, take note that uh, development services uh, process improvements are now I'm sorry, is it green-lighted or yellow-lighted? It, it sounded like it was some progress, is that right? It's going to be green. Okay, great. Could you just tell us a bit about sort of where we're at then on that uh, on that work stream? Actually, I have two members, one from project management and Alex, if you can. That'd be great. If you could tell us just a little bit, Alex, about what, I'm sorry, Alex and? Jennifer. Jennifer, great. If, if either of you could just tell us a little bit about um, the deliverables that we hope to see in, in, in what kind of timeline, that'd be great. Yes, absolutely. Um, Alex Powell, uh, Planning, Building, Code Enforcement, and also Product Owner for the Development Service Transformation Effort, um, joined with by Jennifer Pioze, uh, member of I, uh, Information Technology Department. Um, the status change from green, or from yellow to green was really a reset on the remaining work, mostly around our sjpermits.org portal um, we have recently deployed uh, a major new feature to allow customers to start their applications online. And that for the, that feature for uh, public works planning and for the fire department, uh, building is still the remaining piece of that. So pulling out that piece and resetting where does the building team actually deploy the self-start feature for, I should clarify, excuse me, um, for all of their non-self-administered permits, which have been available on SJ permits for nearly a decade. Um, we reset that timeline, and so resetting it took us from a yellow status to green. Okay. Um, I believe your last question was really about what's to come, though, and what is the additional work. And yeah, so what do we think we can accomplish? Uh, excuse me? Yeah, what do we think we're going to be able to accomplish? You know? Yes, and so as part of their um, pulling back the ability to do self-started applications, again, ones that aren't issued through the portal immediately that we take in and then go through plan review, the, uh, the building team determined that it was more appropriate for them to wait for the next feature set that we're currently working on and was mentioned on the slide, which is what we are currently calling the application wizard. The wizard is sort of similar to a helper. So a customer can come in, answer a bunch of questions, and eventually push them into this is the application type, subtype, work type that you would need to enter into the system so they self-start their application correctly and so that they can um, submit their application correctly. If they don't do that correctly, it actually creates more work for staff to actually correct the folder, or really, or excuse me, their permit, um, they need to correct it. They would actually need to cancel it and then actually restart folder, thereby creating more work for us. Building thought of this as actually a greater risk and actually with that application wizard that we're hoping to have created by, I think it's in June or July, excuse me, in July of, uh, of 2023, um, that they'll actually enable their customers to do that successfully. Once they make that leap to the self-started, we should be at over 90% of building applications that can either be self-administered or self-started through SJ permits. When you say self-started, that means Information is entered through the wizard, then people know what box they go into in terms of process. When that's done, what happens next? They still need to show up at City Hall or what? Typically. Yeah, uh, great question. So, of course, and, and sorry for the long winded answer in advance. No, it's okay. Um, self administered permits today, especially in the uh, sort of post COVID world, actually presents about 70 to 80% of our issued permits. So, again, about 70 to 80% of all permits uh, issued in the city. Customers actually start online, can get it issued, pay, and they actually get their permit, can start construction. Um, generally, we'll say within 15 minutes, but I think I've done it down in three to four minutes. And that's now 70%? Is that right? 70, 70 to 80, yes. Okay, um, of the total quantity of permits just by. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, right. and, and that would make sense for just our smaller applications. Yeah. You know, the water heaters, the solar, um, uh, solar panels, which are just uh, a quantity or volume-wise. 
Now, the majority of the work that we think about, new construction, uh, additions to your home, um, those are things that are still going to require plan review. So we can't just issue your permit, still require staff to review. So when customers get through the process of actually starting their application, they're never going to end with you receive your permit, you pay. We still want staff to receive all of their application uh, information, which is generally you think of the classic application form, but then also the documents that are actually pertain to that as well. All submitted and actually all contained within what we would call in our Amanda database, uh, or Amanda permitting database, excuse me, is an Amanda folder. Once it's all self-contained into there, we're able to actually, the staff can review it asynchronously, so not with the applicant. They don't need to come into City Hall. Yeah. They don't need to necessarily come to an appointment. Right. Although we think, and again, because this is still six months out, or six, uh, six to, to eight months out, um, that we actually still might want to enable that ability for customers to meet with our permit center sure. staff and then um, get their application triage to a plan review staff member, whoever's appropriate. So it would mostly replicate today, but it would really streamline that early portion of the process, not needing necessarily an appointment, but getting all the information, creating that folder for our staff. So then really staff just need to review if it looks good, the wizard work they applied correctly, we just send it directly to our plan review staff. And does the user encounter the wizard as a bunch of multiple choice questions, or is there like open, uh, essentially AI enabled uh, uh, technology that interprets when I say I got a water heater problem, it understands. <laughs> is there some is there some AI behind this, or is this just multiple choice basically? It, multiple choice. Okay. Yeah. And it's right now we're excuse me. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. Correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's super helpful. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Let me go back to Zoom. Okay, I don't see another hand, so we can entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Great. We have a motion and a second. You can assign them however you'd like, Grace. Let's vote. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Cohen? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. Okay, great. We are on to item two, public emergency notification status report. And as uh, the emergency management staff come up, uh, emergencies of the past three years have shown us how crucial emergency communications are to response and recovery. Along with sudden disasters, the city has made increasing use of wide reach multi-channel communications for hazards awareness, public health instruction, and evacuation direction. The Office of Emergency Management, led by Director Ray Reardon, will take the committee through and the public through San Jose's emergency notification practices and program improvements. And with that, Ray. Good afternoon, um, <clears throat> committee chair, mayor, committee members, city staff, and members of the public. I'm Ray Reardon, the director of the city manager's Office of Emergency Management. And with me today is Daniel Tucker, our alert and warning coordinator for the Office of Emergency Management, who manages the public information, uh, the public emergency notification system. Uh, also assisting in the, the presentation, unfortunately sick, is Jay McCain, so he's not here with us today. There we go. As noted in the memo, the, these are the agencies with whom we must uh, coordinate to, uh, for our public notification program. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, governs public emergency notification nationally through what is known as the IPAWS, or the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. The California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, or Cal OES, uh, supports FEMA by providing guidance to assist in, uh, in alerting authorities and using available alerting tools uh, effectively. Santa Clara County sponsors the emergency notification through funding the Alert Santa Clara, or uh, Alert SEC, uh, through the emergency notification tool known as Everbridge, which is made available to the city of San Jose and the other cities of the county. In general, the use of these public notification systems must be used for imminent or actual public safety emergencies. The risk of not meeting these guidelines is, is the loss of the authority to broadcast messages using these various systems. There is no 100% solution uh, to public emergency notification that reaches 100% of the public. The city's public alert and notification program is to provide actionable life safety information to 90% of the public within specifically defined geographical areas within 10 minutes of the notification initiation. This is aligned with the emergency services alert, emergency alert system metric of 90% contact. 
from our post evaluation of each of these notifications that have taken place in the last year and beyond, um, <clears throat> we've been successful in using the opt-in services of the Alert SCC and Nixville. Opt-in means you have to go in and register some way or some form. <clears throat> Uh, Nixle and Alert SCC systems access data sources from reverse 911 and believe it or not, yellow and white pages, they still exist. Yes, they do. In addition, we also use opt out systems such as social media and the wireless emergency alert system. Finally, we can use uh, our long range acoustical devices to broadcast messages over loudspeaker in multiple languages within a, a mile radius. And we were very successful at helping uh, Santa Rosa five years ago at this time with uh, post-fire re-entry using those LRAD systems. Each emergency is unique. Each notification is evaluated by geo-defined area, the population density, the ability to send languages in multiple languages, and the time of day. We don't want to use certain devices at midnight if we can avoid it. During the last fiscal year, 19 notifications were coordinated and issued by the City of San Jose Police Department, Fire Department, Emergency Operations Center, and the Office of Emergency Management. These notifications included uh, outreach on the vaccination program. Uh, we had events like gas leaks, potential flooding. Yes, we did have potential flooding this last year, even though we've been in a drought. A child abduction, fire alarm, uh, five alarm fires, silver alert, and at risk risking persons. And we also had a police action that we wanted to uh, notify the public on. In the last year, we focused on the use of the wireless alert system, the wireless alert system uh, with great success. And why have we done that? According to the Pew Research, over the past two decades, cell phone ownership has increased to 97% of the population. And ownership of smartphones has risen to 85%. As such, the WIA remains uh, one of the most effective, efficient, and reliable alert and warning tools that the city, of, the, the city of San Jose is equipped with to notify the public about disaster or emergency and to encourage them to take specific action. As previously mentioned, notifications are typically designed to alert a defined geographic area, depending on the event. Each notification tool at our disposal has unique characteristics uh, which determine their efficacy during the notification process. This graphic shows the difference uh, between the three tools that we tend to use. The larger notification area shown in the lighter blue uh, area uh, is our least accurate system at this time, but I want to focus on the targeted areas, the orange and the yellow. In that small area, in the orange area, that's where we use the alert SCC system. Because it uses the white pages and the yellow pages, it can get down to specific addresses and keep it within that arena. The larger notification boundary in the yellow is that Nixle, that Nixle uh, effort, which can be supported um, by anonymous entry of data. So you don't have to provide your name or address, any of those details, but you provide a, a, a zip code into the system, and that's how it uh, knows that you need notification within that area. With the advent of increased technology and newer devices, we will be able to pinpoint more of the WIA notification so we don't have that overbleed like you see in the blue uh, zone there in the graphic. We do see that the single most effective and easiest way to notify the public is to use the anonymously opting in service of the Nixle alerts. And you obtain that by going into your uh, text messaging capability, putting in the phone number 888-777 and insert your zip code. That could be a zip code of your home, your business, uh, schools, wherever you need to get information because you might be in different locations or your children or your family may, may be in different locations. You can also unsubscribe from Nixel by sending the word stop all to the same phone number, 888-777. By far our most accurate mass notification system available to the city is the Alert SEC. As previously noted, this combines the reverse 911, yellow pages, white pages, and specific information that Everbridge purchases from other wireless carriers. 
And that puts it all into one database uh, where we can contact general uh, residents of Santa Clara County because it's a countywide system. But we focus on the city of San Jose. By creating a specific account with Alert SEC, participating residents and businesses customize their preferred communication channels to include traditional landline phones, if they still have them, mobile phones, SMS text services, email, uh, or mobile push notifications. You can also select the language you prefer to get that notice in. This is done by going to the Alert SEC website, which is www.alertsec.org. The challenge of getting people to sign up on here is obviously data privacy, and that's the concern and the challenge we face in getting folks to sign up on Alert SEC. According to a recent calmatters.org article, the numbers for the city of San Jose are similar of registrants are similar to other counties in the Bay Area, somewhere between 6 and 12 percent, depending on the specific area and perhaps the duplication of data, because they may have signed up on Alert SEC, they may have signed up on Nixle, and so you have two entries for one person, so it sort of doubles the numbers of, of entries as you see. We do see that increasing participation in the use of Nixle Alert can be, best be accomplished through providing these kinds of Not this kind of advertisement through our normal communication sources, such as through city council communications, departmental uh, uh, newsletters and programs, uh, like the library and parks and recreational neighborhood services already used on a regular basis. We'd like to propose that the goal of increasing registration within a 2% uh, arena uh, area each year is reasonable. And that's also consistent with what we're finding in other counties and other jurisdictions that use these alert and warning systems. The areas that have the highest percentage of registration in these kinds of systems are the areas that are in high fire risk, like Sonoma County. They tend to have a higher rate because there's more people concerned about that risk because it surrounds the entire county. So um, we do look forward to having the support of providing information out to encourage people to sign up. This slide, this slide does show some of the public information materials available for use, and they're available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Mandarin. The Office of Emergency Management partners with the Police Department and the Fire Department to coordinate and send these emergency notifications as part of the City of San Jose's Public Alert Notification Program. After each notification, we take the time to review the use of the system, the effectiveness of the alert, the level of action taken by the public so that we can determine what's the best use of the systems and the appropriate system at the right time. With that, that was our presentation and we're available for questions. Great. Thanks, Ray and Daniel. Appreciate it. Uh, I am okay. Looks like we do have public comment. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Sadly, uh, I, I have to rush kind of my public comment because uh, my public comment wasn't noted at the very beginning. I wish you guys could have noticed uh, my public comment work plan, but we'll continue. And just to note that uh, really try to make that an important uh, point uh, to allow public comment uh, on each item of a, of a council agenda in the future. Uh, for this item, just uh, an overall thank you that, uh, an overall continued thank you in the very good practices you are offering um, uh, the future of uh, emergency, emergency preparedness at this time. I think you guys are doing a, a great, great job. And it's been, I think because of the events of the flood issues of 2017, um, along with the concepts of what can be important federal funding we can receive by doing these good practices now, uh, is a combination of things uh, that it's just, it's, it's, I think you guys have always, I always like to say now, are just creating a great example for uh, other Bay Area cities, how to connect with their community. You are really doing a good job in that department. Thank you. Uh, so much so, you know my feelings. Do we have to really be worried about 2023 or not? I don't know yet, uh, but you're certainly preparing us uh, in good terms, and I just I can't thank you enough for that. Thank you. Um, 
I, uh, if we do have a, a major earthquake coming up soon, there is going to be issues of, uh, you know, uh, um, technology, uh, telecommunications te lines are going to be down a lot. They're, they're not going to be fully operational. And I hope we've made, made steps to create uh, community lines of, of availability, the same we've created BayRIC systems. Thank you. Back to the committee. Great, thank you. I believe uh, Councilor Cohen is up first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the report, um, Ray and team. Um, just a couple of questions for you. You were talking about these three different methods for reaching out to uh, residents. There was a Nixle, Alert CC, and the WIA. And then when you were showing promotions of, of Alert CC, it seemed that Nixle and Alert CC are the same thing. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? They're relatable. They're, so if you sign up on Nixle, it encourages you to sign up an Alert SEC and vice versa. I see. So when you use the, do the text to the 888-777 number, are you, are you signing up for both or are you only really signing up for one and then you still have to go sign up for the other? That is correct. Which one's correct? You have to sign up for so, the other? Both? So you, if you go to Nixle, uh, which is the 888-777, that, that signs you up for the Nixle anonymous reporting within that zip code. Uh, and then when you go to the alert SEC, you have more um, opportunities, options to select, including language selection. Okay. Um, and how are we, um, you showed the publicity, I guess there's, there's social media and other ads that are trying to direct people to do, to sign up for these services. Correct. We, we do it through our, our own publications as well as through the, the county also supports that effort. And we're encouraging that other departments as well as council members assist us in that uh, getting the word out. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, also, it seems like these are important enough for people to potentially for us to potentially invest a little bit in, in advertising, whether it be radio or other media so that people know that this is a tool that's important. Do we, have we done any of that? Uh, we've been working first on uh, the avenues that we've discussed here, and that is certainly something we can consider. Okay. And is the, are the, I assume the publicity is in multiple languages? Yes. Okay. Um, for the, the, the WIA system is an opt out. And I know that a lot of people received the uh, messages about vaccination clinics and might've decided they didn't want to continue to hear those, get those messages and opted out. Do, do we know the percentage of people who opted out of that system during the last year? Unfortunately, we do not get that kind of data from the WIA system because that goes to the carriers and beyond. So we don't get that report notification in, uh, directly. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll move acceptance of the report. Great, do we have a second? Thank you, Mayor. Okay, great, is your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Ray, I'm, I'm sure you're tired of these kinds of questions, but I'll ask it anyway. So I signed up for Alert SEC and I signed up for the Nixle system. And uh, and I assume Nixle was very geographically focused, but for some reason I'm getting all these notices about traffic in Los Gatos, which I know is a great concern to the good people of the town of Los Gatos, but I live east of downtown in San Jose. And do you have any idea why? I, Matt was just saying he was getting the same thing. Is Los Gatos just taking over our emergency system or what? Thank you for the question, Mayor. Um, <laughs> right or not. Uh, but un unfortunately, there are times there's overbleed because of conditions, you know, just even radio frequencies can go beyond what they're intended to do yeah. because of atmospheric conditions. So that does happen. But there is there is sharing Nixel too. And so we can look and see if there's some sort of sharing with Los Gatos in the same use that we have of our Nixel unit. So is it, is it based on where I am or where my residence is? Do you have any idea? Uh, say again, I'm sorry. Is it based on where my cell phone is or based on where my residence is? I'm curious. It's based on whatever you register. So if, if you know, cause you have to actually put in your zip code. Okay. And, and so it's, it's, so it's based on the zip code. It's based on the zip code. So that. So my know. driving around on highway no. 17 shouldn't affect it. No. Okay. Just curious. Thanks. The we alert though is different and that can, depending yeah. on you driving around, you can pick it up. And uh, I, I know you're also probably tired of this question too, but <laughs> um, 
this is all physicists would like to have an integrated theory of the universe. Is there any integrate hope for integration of all these systems to come up with the one great emergency notification system? I think it's all layered, and like we're saying, we can't use just one system to do everything, so we have to apply, based on the situation we're facing, the various layers, and that diagram you have in the memo really identifies why we use a variety of systems, because there yeah. is no one, one solution at this point. But integration, I sure that's that's what we're hoping for and looking forward to, uh, but there is no one specific answer at this time. Yeah, I appreciate why you need a lot of different ways to try to reach people. It just puzzles me that we, yeah, we're all signing up for this. Well, I'm stuff. glad you're listening. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Ray, just quickly, the 90% goal, is that a standard or what, how did we come up with that target? Yeah, it started with the emergency alert system, which again is a federal asset and, and that's what their goal was. And so we try to emulate that and put Got that it. as a target. Got it. And the contributing sources toward the 90% are the three we discussed. There are no others. It's just those three channels. We don't count anything else toward our progress. Right. It's just those. Okay. And today we are, I heard you say we're comparable in the 6 to 12 range. Do we know where we are specifically? We're, we're close. Well, conservatively, you want to say 6, but when we look at the numbers, we're closer to 12. Okay. But again, there's duplication because you signed up a Nixle and alert. I see. Right, right. So There's you overlap. Up with these duplicate yeah, you numbers, that. and so we yeah. want. We would love to say twelve, but we feel closer to six. Yeah. Okay. Great. And we think we can grow. We think a, a normal average growth rate is going to be about two percent. Two percent is what has been yeah. identified in, in the world of alert and warning. Yeah. I, I guess I would, and I don't know if there's any budget capacity for this. I would just echo Councilor Cohen's um, encouragement to experiment with. Uh, radio, I was going to throw in, um, you know, digital, digital, tar geographically targeted digital ads. If we think, you know, this could be a matter of life and death, you know, the more people we have on this system, then I think it would uh, be worth doing some experimentation to see if there's a, if there's a low cost of acquisition, if it costs us a few cents to get a sign up, it might actually be worth putting some maybe, money maybe. behind that, you know, but unless we test it, we won't know. Good suggestion. Thank you. Cool. Great. Okay. I think, um, just double check here. I don't think we... I'm sorry, just to follow up on that. I, I think Facebook does offer some free uh, advertising to agencies Obviously, and nonprofits. Yeah. So we, we may get some freebies out of this. We'll get the older generations cool. <laughs> I'll take that action item, um, Mayor and Chair, to uh, cut in contact with our civic good team. Thanks, Rob. Okay, great. I think we're ready to vote. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, we're on to our third and final item of the day, Digital Privacy Committee Engagement Status Report. Rob, do you want to introduce? Yes, please. Um, and as Khaled and Albert come down, this is the final in a group of privacy items for the committee and city council to review in 2022. Uh, San Jose established, as you know, one of the leading privacy programs in North America with our principles and privacy policy and is working with other uh, Vanguard agencies to create and adapt new standards of engagement to shape the careful use of identifying data and technology and service delivery. Our Chief Information Officer, uh, Khaled uh, Tofik, uh, will introduce this item with our Digital Privacy Officer, Albert Kahami. Thank you, Rob. Good afternoon again, Council, I mean, uh, Chairperson Mehan, uh, Mayor Ricardo, Council members and members of the public. My name is Khaled Tofik, Chief Information Officer, and to my left is Albert Kahami, Digital Privacy Officer. We're here to present our effort and plans to advance the Digital Privacy Community Engagement Program through public participation and partnership with the Digital Privacy Advisory Task Force and stakeholders. Through the public engagement process, we learned about moving at the speed of trust and made great progress in engaging and educating the public regarding new technologies and data privacy. Our progress was the result of our strong, strong relationship with the police department Project Hope from the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, who facilitated several neighborhood meetings, and the City Manager's Com Communications Office, who helped us craft a clear message to continue our public engagement effort. We look forward to continue our journey as we advance the use of technology and innovation in the city, while respecting and protecting the privacy of our community. I will now turn it over to Albert Gahami. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Colin. And 
Thank you, uh, council members, member of the committee, mayor, and the public uh, for taking the time and listening to us yet again talk about privacy. But I think this is a important element that I want to make clear here. We're not we're not talking about any particular technology today. What we want to talk about is really the learnings and what we've found in the investment that we've made over the past year when it comes to engaging residents and talking to them not just specifically about one any particular initiative but on the efforts of technology in the city as a whole what we found there so um thank you so um just a bit of context here for everyone um our privacy policy 0-46 was developed um finalized in 2020 and put into effect in 2021 and five out of the seven principles within it mention in some way shape or form something about public engagement and i think that just really goes to show the important value that this conversation that we're having with the members of the public it's it's a constantly changing and moving target as we figure out what residents are willing to trade off and work with when it comes to the technology and data collection by our city Three of them include accuracy, making sure that when we're thinking about algorithms that you know, they are effective, they understand them, and we can communicate them. That residents are given notice to be able to determine when and to what extent information about them is communicated to others, at least as much as we can. And of course, from an equity perspective, making sure that our residents just have a line of communication and know who to talk to if they do have a concern about their privacy or about some of the technology in the city. This policy was developed largely thanks to the collaboration and conversations that we had, not only with members of the general public, but also with our Digital Privacy Advisory Task Force. And those conversations started in 2016, 2017, and have really evolved since then into something around what our digital privacy program looks like when rubber meets the road. As we go further and further and deeper into implementation, the complexity of the problems get higher and the values, judgments, and decisions that we're making get more difficult to do alone. And that's why we're pushing much more for community engagement. And one of the things that we've seen, and if I could leave you with one thing today, is that we've seen how much residents want to understand the technology around them. Um, what I have on the left here is an example email of what we've been getting of just residents asking um, our IT department to come down and speak at their neighborhood association meeting to learn about some of the technology that is being put up in our city by our city. Um, and we've seen this for several different types of technologies, several different types of conversations. Um, one of my favorite is actually a uh, little work that I did with, or that we did with District 10 staff, um, Council Member Mahan's staff. Um, a resident had a privacy concern that they had been trying to get a solution for for roughly a year or so. Um, things just weren't lining up, but fortunately they were able to find um, our digital privacy contact information on the web. Call us up. We were able to get it resolved with your staff and, and with our staff in a few weeks. And not only did we resolve their problem, which they were very happy about, and to be quite honest, made my day when we had that conversation with them, but um, it also showed us a um, privacy concern that we had in general that we've been able to address because of what the resident had, right? And, you know, I think this goes for every department in the city we only have so many staff to figure out every problem in the city. So being able to have that type of collaborative relationship with residents and flagging things to us has been incredibly helpful. So how did we get here? Answer, short and sweet, incredible city staff and with great support from the Knight Foundation that we've had to really kickstart this equity through data and privacy program in the IT department. Um, we've seen support from the city manager's office supporting us with communications, the police department, of course, Department of Transportation, 
Um, and as Khaled mentioned, uh, Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, who have been fantastic at helping us really get to the ground level and just talk with neighborhood associations and members of the community. And of course, additional major thanks have come from our expert input from our Privacy Task Force. What you see in this table is just a small sample, but I think a very important sample of the types of input that we've gotten from our advisory task force and how we've been able to incorporate that into the way that we do privacy in the city. Functionally, their role is to advise and recommend on the policies and practices of our city's privacy. Um, and really what you see here is just some high level ideas from that. Our task force is composed of ideally two members each of government, um, academia, civil liberties, and, um, or, sorry, my brain is blinking, um, but government, academia, civil liberties, and private sector. Um, right now, our task force is going through a bit of a shift as we're moving from a very high level talk about policy to implementation. So. We have four members currently. We actually just recruited one more, so we have five members now. Uh, we recruited one member from government, and now we are looking for one more from civil liberties, one more from academia, and one more from government to make sure we really round that out. And one additional element of conversation that we're having is how can we incorporate more of the resident voice into this task force? So that is something that we are in conversations with right now to see who would be a good fit for that, how to balance both an, an expert input with resident involvement but something that we're looking towards moving forward. One of the things I wanna highlight here is just, um, I think this slide paints a, a small fragment of the picture, but a, a picture in its own right of how the engagement that we've seen has pivoted a bit of the conversation and in my opinion, matured a lot of the conversation that we're having between us and our residents and around when it comes to technology in the city. The IT department with police and with the city manager's office of communications conducted a series of engagement throughout the summer months, um, specifically around traffic safety technology. Um, and what you can see here is a little bit of the before and after on what we saw in some of the news headlines. And just in general, the conversation that we saw both in the media and a bit in the, in the public sphere was, uh, first, one of potential interest, curiosity, but maybe a little bit of concern and a feeling that we might not be addressing all of the privacy concerns. But one of the things that we felt most accomplished with was a recognition that we have addressed those concerns by the time that we did conduct this outreach. And I think regardless of what technology that is and what we're looking at, I think that does go to show that if we can explain and we can talk through this, we can see some positive headwinds when it comes to how residents are thinking about this technology. In general, our approach to outreach and engagement right now is fairly new. Um, going back to the point of we are the information technology department. Um, public facing hasn't traditionally been our role, but increasingly between privacy, equity through data, SJ through run one and other forms, we have become more public facing. So we are pushing more and more down the IAP2 spectrum to go from what is currently more of an inform and consult approach to data and privacy and other approaches to ideally get to somewhere closer to involving and collaborating residents where it makes sense. What we see coming up, um, a variety of things, but just to follow up a bit on the council meeting that we had around really where we're trying to focus a lot of our privacy efforts. First and foremost, we are talking about artificial intelligence and automation. The city, like many others, are seeing the value in being able to automate a lot of processes, the money that can be saved, and how we can do things faster, better. But of course, with that comes making sure that those algorithms and those automated systems are not only efficient, but we are able to mitigate bias and produce a more equitable service than we do currently. Um, that, along with iterative engagement, we've really been able to build a bridge. And while it certainly took some time to build that bridge of engagement, we have it now and we can continue to cross it with iteration and engagement faster, more streamlined, and more effective. 
And then one other conversation that I think is recently rising up is around external data resources. And what does it mean for the city to be able to purchase data from third parties to be able to get incredibly valuable information on how to provide the best services? So just to give you a little deeper dive into the picture of what we're looking at right now, here's just a small list of some of the technologies that we're in conversations with, with departments around the privacy element, around responsible usage of the technology, and how to use it most effectively. Um, one that I will highlight, and I think has been top of mind for a lot of people, has been the conversation around drones. And I just want to tackle that very briefly, um, that our drones, both used by police and fire, have been reviewed from a privacy perspective, they have privacy policies, they've done engagement, and honestly, they do have very strong transparency, especially police with how they use this. So I know there is concern about that, but I think there is that is a matter of communication of really some of the great work that's already happened, um, and really looking forward into things like speed cameras, red light cameras, and other types of pilots that we want to do as a city. So we'll leave it at that um, and happy to answer questions, but uh, thank you again for your time and patience throughout this process and uh, you know, being able to share with you some of the learnings that we've had in it. Great, thanks Albert and Callan. Appreciate uh, the update and your obvious passion for community engagement and good privacy practices. Why don't we see if anyone from the public wants to chime in? Blair Beekman. All right, Blair here. Last place, Blair. Remedial Blair. Uh, hopeful Blair. Uh, good luck uh, with this issue. You guys offered some interesting. Uh, you are trying to move forward uh, with how to address the community better. Thank you. Now we have to put those good ideas and intentions to real good practice. Um, we we have just celebrated or whatever uh, marked the 21st anniversary of 9-11. We're dealing with COVID issues. I think the public concepts of public oversight and accountability and honesty, it, we're at a time that these ideas simply can be possible. And I think we want to really work towards uh, those ideas, both as community and as government. And we have to learn, you have to learn as government how to be more accountable and honest with the public on this sort of thing. There is not a national security, you know, death uh, trap happening here. We're not going to die and plunder into the great abyss by you openly talking about these practices with the community. It, it, the, the, what happened uh, at the ALPR meeting and what Flock offered at that meeting was close to horrific and horrendous. Um, they did not, they said they did not offer any sort of data collection at all, which is so absolutely false that you guys themselves have been trying to uh, introduce the, the concept to community and Flock completely ruined it. I'm really eager to see how you guys are going to make up to that and, and, and bring the community along to understand those concepts. We're, they are bundling technology and selling it and selling the data collection. We got to understand those concepts. You got to learn to share that in this new abortion era of data collection, of commercialized data collection of streetlights uh, technology. Uh, they're selling that information. We got to talk, have those conversations. You can't be afraid of those conversations with the public. Good luck how we do that this fall. Thank you. Back to the committee. Great. Thank you. Zoom. Yeah, I just I'm thinking a little bit more about this task force and what seems to be, I think a, there's a significant difference of a perception. And by the way, thank you, Albert, for all the work you're doing. I know you're doing a lot in the community. And it's just it's a really important conversation. But I think there's a lot of different perceptions about privacy and threats uh, that may be posed by technology, as you know, between our residents who may benefit from or encounter this technology in some way and people who spend a lot of time thinking about this <laughs> whether they're uh, privacy advocates with aclu or whether they're in government or technology companies and they think a lot about it and i guess one thing i'm a little worried about as i look at this task force and you know, currently we have a member of the ACLU on it, a, a 
obviously very senior person at Cisco. And adding to that people from academia, government, and civil liberties organizations doesn't me necessarily tell me they're going to have a very good, it's going to be a very clear sense um, of understanding what the community is really concerned about uh, in terms of privacy. I know a lot of us, myself included, are at fault for believing we represent the community in some way because we have an opinion about something. And um, so, uh, are we? I just, I know you mentioned trying to figure out how you broaden the circle. Um, you think about maybe including neighborhood leaders, uh, maybe parents who are dealing with the daily challenges of technology and their kids might be involved in PTA, something like that. Rob, you want to address that one? Yeah, I, I can help uh, partially. Um, so one of the things from the Charter Review Commission also was to get more of the, the community's voice in that. Yeah. The discussions we had were around that recommendation is how do you, how do you involve more of the community voice? Because uh, you're right, Mayor, what we've seen so far is two very different um, types of communication, the activists, um, the advocates. Um, there, there is a lot of concern there, and they, they dive deeply. Uh, and then when we engage the community, most of the communications have actually have been, I'd like this use in, in my area. And so that's where we're trying to fill out that board. And then also when we're doing the principles and policy, it was very conceptual. We were one of the leading cities, one of the first four to really dive in. So that was the right fit, but that is the pivot we're doing right now is getting more of that, that opinion of how do you do the right thing and, and be responsible, but still apply and answer the community's problems rather than keep it theoretical. The, the thing we do have is at least two positions, and we're open to feedback on this one, um, that we're going to add that are community-based based on the Charter Review Commission. And um, we have it on our list to, to talk with Modi um, from your office to say, who do you think um, those people might best be? And then also with other departments who, who would speak well and understand the issue well enough to help us come up with the right decisions. I'm not sure, Albert, if you want to add to that. Uh, Rob, I think you covered just about all of it, um, just to say that we're looking for at least two community members, or that's our intention, more than happy to get feedback on that. And that one of the avenues that we're able to use to see who might be good for that is actually through all of the neighborhood associations that we've reached out to. So we don't have the people locked in yet, but being able to reach out to those have been very helpful in at least starting to get a voice out there and see who might be interested in this. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, obviously, we have a very diverse community, so it's hard to say, hey, we're going to have one or two people who are going to, quote, unquote, represent the community. That's challenging. But I would imagine it would be unique, for example, when we have a very large immigrant population. I mean, nearly 40% of our adults are born in a foreign country. Some of those adults came from former communist countries or authoritarian countries that may have very strong feelings about it. It would be good to have, you know, those kinds of views expressed along with, you know, someone's born and raised here. So it would just be, I appreciate that. Thank you. And if I can add two more things, um, on the work plan for next year that we've discussed, Mayor, uh, I think speaks to your point and uh, would be good for extra feedback, is one continuing the outreach, and Khaled is, um, is looking at how to add some resources that into next year so we can keep this going. It's not just a one-time effort, but we keep the learning going. Um, and uh, number two is the use of the Promotodas program. Yeah. Um, and so maybe making that two-way as well, not just dissemination of information, but um, how we can get more of that community feedback. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. I had sort of a related question just coming at it from a different angle, which is on slide six, I was interested to see the feedback from the community and then how we're striving to be responsive, which I think is, is great. Uh, I'm curious, and this may become more of an issue as we get into implementing your list of technologies on slide 10, as we are striving to be responsive to the task force, have we yet run into a tension between alleviating their privacy concerns and still being able to have the capability that we're looking for and the efficacy of the tool? Have we run into that tension yet or has it so far been that everything's kind of mitigatable and we don't think it reduces the efficacy from our perspective? Do that's sort of an abstract question. No, but I, sure. I assume that's gonna be an issue as we go through implementing each of these. So I think, uh be completely honest on that, we ran into a bit of that tension already, and that's what we saw in this kind of growing pains of moving the task force from something that was very high level, 
um, principles oriented into actually getting our, you know, rolling up our sleeves and figuring out how to work with each technology. But where we are now with the task force, and I've been able to talk both with them all in meetings and one-on-one -on -one is get a sense that we are in it to figure out how to use technology to serve our residents the best. And right. obviously we're going to get some conflicting opinions there, but we want just a little bit of that conversation because otherwise I'd much rather have us hear those concerns there than 20 years down the line. And that's not to say that we're listening in to any specific task force member uh, you know, more so than another. Um, but just getting those voices have really helped. And with the task force members that we have right now, my sense is that the tension that we will see as we push forward with these technologies is going to be a healthy one. Okay. Good. Um, but That's good to hear. Yeah. I've, I've certainly had experience in the past with privacy concerns getting to an extreme where it can cripple an organization or the implementation of a tool, and I'm sure we're mindful of that. And I think the mayor's point is, is a really good one because one way of mitigating that is to diversify and bring in, you know, more average residents who really want these capabilities in a lot of cases. And we have to, we have to find that balance. And there's a risk of if the emphasis is on privacy, that can also be something that we can overbuild for or overemphasize versus getting the the capability or the impact that we really need. I know it's a it's a difficult thing to uh, a difficult balance to strike. If you do run into, is there a what is your threshold for getting to a point where a council committee such as this one would be aware of a potential trade off between efficacy or capability and then a, a privacy mitigating a privacy concern. This might be a fairly general answer, um, but the main things that come to my mind are when does it not become beneficial to all residents or all communities, or when are we over-exaggerating the effectiveness of that technology? And I think this is something common, um, not just here, but in many places where you've seen the attempt to implement some type of AI system it might have done something, but it might have just been not worth the money. <laughs> I mean, to, to be completely honest, right? Efficacy and bias are two main measures. So that's really how I think about it and how when it comes to things that we want to flag, really where we want to come down and make sure that you are informed and aware of. Yeah. And I think it actually and, dovetails with our conversation on item one around how do we measure the value of projects and if we think we're eroding the underlying value in order to um, satisfy the concerns of a, of a very vocal minority. I think we need to have a conversation potentially at this committee of well, what, what trade-offs are you facing and, and what do you recommend? I just, I'm anticipating as we look at actually implementing all these great tools that we're gonna run into this tension over and over again. And uh, it sounds like we're being pretty thoughtful about it, which is great, but um, I guess just flagging that is, Conversation, recurring conversation. I'm assuming we're going to have. So um, that was all I wanted to say on that. I don't. Carla, do you look like you want to yeah, jump in? I just in? want Go to ahead. add one thing. I think yeah. a little bit of friction is healthy, and yeah. as long as we the conversation is moving forward, I think we are getting something. We we are, we are stepping on uncharted territories and leading the nation in in a conversation that a lot of other cities are avoiding. So the fact that we we feel that there is value, and we through the last few months when we went to community engagement. We learned so much, and we were able to frame the conversation toward privacy and benefits before we discussed the technology and whatever else comes with it. So as we, we view it as a positive continuous improvement, and when we feel that it, we're not making progress, I think that's going to be the time that we need to step back and, and reassess where we are and take some actions at that point. Yeah, thank you. And, and I appreciate that, and, and for the record, I really think the engagement's critical. I think it's just important that we um, are balancing all the different desires of the community and really getting that representative sense of what how people want to trade off privacy with, with some of these capabilities and benefits. So that's great. Okay, I don't see any other hands, so unless anybody has anything else, we should, uh, I believe we need to entertain a motion to accept the report. Great. Moved by the mayor. Second. A second. Second. Great. Let's vote. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Cohen? Aye. Mahan? 
Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for the report, and we are on to open forum. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for the meeting today. Thanks a lot for the words of the mayor, uh, how to bring everyday public into the future of the uh, oversight process. That is so beautiful. You guys really are working on it. And to Councilperson Mahan, uh, engagement is key for all sides of the issues. It is not just a small vocal minority. There, there are serious issues to contend with about the concepts of open democracy and the future of economic practices. We have to address those things formally as a full community process. Good luck to conversations we can have on this issue in the future. I think it will be very interesting and enlightening for both of us. Um, I guess just overall, overall um, yeah, good luck uh, to uh, city government staff. Um, the mayor has built a, a really interesting good team of city government that will be in place long after he leaves as mayor. And uh, I think his legacy, uh, hopefully, in addressing these sort of uh, open technology, uh, open public policy practices, um, is key to uh, developing a really interesting legacy of the mayor. And that I think will just develop the future of San Jose and, in fact, this country in just amazingly interesting good terms. Uh, we're headed towards a future of peace. The concepts of peace and not war is how to make decisions of our of our of our local communities and and the concepts of open democracy. Um, that's a lot that I hope Councilperson Mayhem really weighs with his choices of wanting to consider economy before democracy. So good luck to ourselves how we work on these issues, and I, I think we really are headed in a good direction. Thank you. Uh, I hope this fall we we really concentrate on concepts of honesty. That's all I ask of yourselves at this time. What can be concepts of how to be honest, more honest in talking about what we're doing with our tech? If we work towards and accomplish those goals this fall, we're, we're on the way. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you, everyone. With that, we're adjourned. Have a great rest of the day. And Blair's right about the team, even if I can't take any credit for it. <laughs>